with me I have uh, Dirk Scheinerd from, uh, from Leipzig, Germany, and Joe Lombardi, who comes to us from Cooper University. And so we're just going to spend a little time talking about, uh, we had the late-breaking clinical trials, and the, really the first session centered around the SFA, and so we heard the five-year data from the impact uh, registry with really excellent results through five years, and then it was juxtaposed by using the, the TACIT device, uh, really the short segment uh, TAC within the SFA and, and good uh, one-year trial results. And then the global registry uh, and the U.S. registry for Stellarex looking at that there was really a treatment effect in women despite having longer lesions and having uh, smaller vessels. And then the one-year alluvia with really looking at the lesions that average 16 centimeters, so longer than 140, showing a benefit over PTX. And then, and so we have all that data, but really nothing really tells us, well, what should I use in my practice? And so really what I'd like to start off with saying is, okay, so we have each year we were here, we have new emerging data sets that come out there. You know, I get asked all the time, well, what's the right thing to do? Should I use a DCB? Should I use a scaffold? Should I use a drug loading scaffold? Should I use a tacket? Um, how do you guys work that into your clinical practice and, and, how, and how do you decide and where do you think you are today compared to maybe two or three years ago with the data we've seen? So Dirk? Well, uh, if, when I may, if I may start, uh, I, I would clearly say that uh, over the last years we have certainly much more scientific information available on uh, many of the, and, and we have m more new tools available, effective new tools available um, with, to treat uh, patients with superficial femoral artery disease. I think drug-coated balloons certainly have changed the landscape uh, and uh, enable us to treat many, uh, many patients without permanent scaffolds. At the same time, we now see um, that there are also new drug eluting stands coming, becoming available. Um, and of course, we can combine these devices. I think what we are essentially lacking now, despite that we have so many scientific studies uh, which have been completed in, in the last years, what we are still uh, lacking now is head-to-head -head comparisons of different uh, technologies and of different treatment strategies. Um, which eventually I think we would help us to make uh, um, treatment decisions for our patients. So for the time being, I think it is uh, left to our uh, clinical judgment to kind of um, integrate the scientific information which we get from individual trials on indi individual devices um, and, 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 and uh, make decisions. So I think uh, clearly the head-to-head -head trial of two uh, drug eluting stents in Imperial was already an important step, but I think what we are now probably are looking for is, uh, for instance, a comparison between a stent-based and a non-stent-based technology for more challenging lesions uh, to derive more relevant conclusions for our practice. How do you think we best start doing that together? I mean, you've been, you just got the live award and congratulations for that. You know, you've led a a ton of trials looking at new devices and I, and I guess you know it's great that Boston really is the first company out there to test head-to-head -head two technologies but what do we do as, as clinicians or single sites to really help push that along I mean you guys have done some some of your registries of your own comparing technologies one over the other how did you get that up and running at your own site and, and how would you tell the rest of us of, of how we reproduce that that phenomenon to have you know single center large you know, registries to start, you know, finding signals so industry will then do a bigger trial for us. Yeah, there's, I think there's no easy answer to that. And uh, I think it's also, I, all, I also feel in a way bad to ask already for more while we just uh, uh, today have seen, uh, you know, the outcome of uh, such big studies like Imperial and, and Impact are good examples. I mean, there has been a lot of in investment and a lot of time and effort from investigators gone into these trials and they helped us to advance our knowledge. But realistically, now we have to go the next step and to, I, I, I think we probably need to look for some more independent uh, uh, funding of such trials because they, of course, go beyond a certain approval uh, of, a, of a certain device. Uh, so it will be probably difficult to set up such head-to-head uh, -head, uh, um, uh, randomized trials. And uh, while we are preparing that, I think, as you mentioned, it's important that uh, I think all big institutions at least, they uh, try the best to 
get their patients into registries and to try to uh, derive data on the real world use, which then can be discussed. But I think it's it's difficult to get uh, you know all answers, uh, all, uh, all questions answered to in the foreseeable future. So, Joe, one of the things that a lot of the trials to talk today about was moderate to severe calcium. And, and we know that they all use core labs and the definition for most core labs for what moderate to severe calcium is, is very still short and focal. And it just seems like in our clinical practices, we deal with really dense calcium. And you know, what's your algorithmic approach when you see that fluoroscopic, really dense calcium of how you're gonna treat it and you know, what are really the gaps in the technologies we have in, in terms of addressing that? That's a good question. Uh, most of the calcifications we see are fairly extensive. So they're not very focal, they're uh, more diffuse. I've uh, got a high diabetic population in our practice. And uh, you know, just getting a wire across some of these CTOs with dense calcifications can be very challenging. Um, but for the most part, you know, we, we give it a good college try when we're in there in terms of trying to get a, a, like a wire across uh, for patients with pretty significant claudication. Um, or, or uh, chronic limb ischemia, uh, they um, don't always work out so well. So we have a pretty low threshold for taking patients to the OR and performing femoral distal bypass uh, in the patient population. But according to these trials, I mean, I, it, it looks like there's a lot of hope in store for, you know, I, I could see a patient, for every one of these trials, I could see a patient that I would have treated with this you know, tack at stent you know, an ineffective angioplasty, or it was an effective angioplasty with just a mild intimal tear. And you're debating on whether or not you want the expense of an additional uh, drug-eluting stent when you just performed a drug-eluting balloon. And uh, that would come in handy for a lot of that situations. And also, the middle-aged smoking female, I mean, that Stellarex DCB has a lot of hope for that very difficult patient population. You know, smaller vessels, very uh, dense uh, disease process in addition to um, just a very poor demographic that doesn't do too well with uh, endovascular uh, uh, interventions. So uh, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of plug and play here uh, for what's to come uh, in terms of uh, new treatment options for these difficult patients. So one of the things we didn't hear this you know, today in the late breaking clinical trials that we heard a lot at Link last year was really the, the coupling of uh, atherectomy with, with drug elution. Uh, you know, it's always timing of data and data sets and and where, where do you think that stands now, Dirk? Is, do you think there's still renewed interest with that? I know with Viva, we're doing the reality trial, looking at directional atherectomy with, with drug elution, and, and I don't think anybody knows yet, but where do you think that, that stands, that technology? Well, I think uh, if, uh, at first that there probably is a lot of potential and a lot of potential need for such technologies. I want to refer to one uh, late breaker uh, presenta presented today in the um, uh, around noon by uh, Mike Dake. He showed uh, uh, data on, on the you know old trial silver PTX ex experience and uh, on predictors for target lesion revascularization and one of the strongest predictors for uh, target lesion revascularization were total occlusions and instant restenosis. These were the sing two single most uh, important factors. And what that shows to me is that uh, plaque burden uh, in CTOs or burden of uh, neo intimal hyperplasia in uh, instant restenosis seems to be a factor which uh, um, has the potential to affect results, even in, even scaffold-based results, in a, in a negative way. Um, and we've, uh, in some of our data sets, we had similar results recently. Uh, so I think in those lesions, we really need to become more effective in preparing the vessel for the eventual treatment, uh, whether that's uh, stent-based or balloon-based. Uh, uh, I think it's probably relevant for, for both uh, treat, treatment uh, approaches. And in that regard, the reality study is going to be very interesting. Uh, I'm sure we learn a, a lot about the applicability uh, of uh, direction atherectomy in that context. Um, but as you know, there are other methods which may be also very suitable for calcium, like rotational atherectomy. So I think we are still need to figure out the right treatment algorithm. But I'm, I'm pretty certain that uh, atherectomy uh, has, a, has a big potential. So why not avoid it? So one of the, the afternoon results was the 18-month data from the PQ Bypass Detour 1 study. Two centers in Europe 
greater than 30 centimeter long lesions, all CTOs, a lot of failed stents and instant resinosis. 18 month data, about a 73% primary patency. So not perfect, but about challenging what you might get with a fem baloney pop bypass. Uh, maybe not with vein, but clearly with PTFE. You know, is, is that something that's gonna have a role in, in, in the future or, or not? I mean, right now we're doing the Detour 2 trial, so we don't know, you know, whether it'll get approval in the US, but it's, you know, you hear, you know, instant restenosis, CTOs don't do as well. So why not just avoid it from the begin with? You know, we have a lot of great devices to power through. Why not just ignore it? I think the real question comes down to whether or not you're going to do that over a fempop bypass. And uh, you know, if you're going to do it with PTFE, you got two small incisions, it takes an hour, and you haven't trashed another another system in order to get it done. My philosophy on that is probably going to be more surgical than interventional, uh, but I could see how that skill set would offer you some distinct advantages uh, for patients who otherwise wouldn't tolerate an open procedure. So I think, uh, I don't think it's going to be a workhorse, but I think it's going to be a nice tool to have in your pocket. I mean, I, I use a lot of deep vein for rescue of infected this and that. And, and so, you know, I think that's one of the good things that the trial is really looking at venous uh, morbidity more, and, and uh, with the Volalta score and the venous clinical severity score. So we actually learned that because it's one of the few untouched big veins in the body that when you really need it, nobody's ever bothered. So... Uh, it, it's interesting to see how that will all play out. I, I know, Dirk, uh, have you had the opportunity to, to try that technique yet? Yeah, we were at one of the sites during these procedures. Uh, um, well, I think it's an interesting endovascular alternative for uh, uh, patients with, with, with really extensive calcification or extensive very bulky lesions, uh, re potentially also redo procedures for a reoccluded stents or something like this. Um, clearly you can go really around it so you don't have to deal with the calcium or the plaque burden and so on. Um, but I, I have to agree with your comment. Of course, uh, there are also surgical alternatives which can do the same. Uh, so if we look at everything a little bit with an endovascular, uh, uh, from an endovascular perspective, it's uh, at least an interesting option to, so to I'm just going to play devil's advocate, and I am a surgeon, and I do a lot of surgery. You know, we all said the same thing for the aortic world, that, well, there's a great surgical alternative, but yet 80% of... Abdominal aortic aneurysms are treated with endovascular means. And, you know, I haven't done a PTFE fem above knee pop bypass, and I can't remember one. I do a lot of fem tibial bypasses. And so if I could do a percutaneous fem pop bypass and there's still vein to go to a tibial, I'm not sure that I would do a vein fem pop bypass if it's going to work and buy some time. But uh, I think to, to me it's... What will be the venous morbidity and what will be the failure mode? So if it fails, what, what cost does it come at? And I think that's the only scientific data is going to help us with. Yeah. Oh, agreed, agreed. But uh, what did they say that the uh, venous uh, morbidity was in that trial? So, so far it's, it's, been, it's not been non-existent. Gotcha. So, wow. It's uh, impressive. It's impressive. And I would I mean, not have predicted that. Well, I mean, I think there's two things. One, the covered stent's only six millimeters in diameter. You have to have a 10 millimeter vein or the vein has to be duplicated, and as we know, 30% of the veins are duplicated. So I, I do think that many times, since these patients are all getting a venogram at the procedure, you, you see a fair number that show up duplicated that didn't show up on the preoperative ultrasound. So, you know, we are selecting out patients that probably have bigger veins than the opportunity to not have as much venous morbidity as someone who's already had a DVT or has a very small femoral vein. So what are what are the things that uh, have got you guys so most excited about the meeting so far today? Is there, is there any talks that have really, uh, that well, you've really been excited about? Well, I think going back to what he said earlier, I think it's really going to come down to how these uh, new treatment options play head to head. I'd like to see some head to head comparisons next year and, uh, you know, try to, try to really distill what's going to be effective in our practice. You know, it's just, Right now, it just seems like it's raining new, new, uh, new technology. It's very difficult to put it all together. Yeah, I think I can only repeat uh, in a way what I what what I already said. It's uh, I think we now really have uh, some very excellent new devices available on the DCB side, on the DS side, 
Um, but we have to be clear that, of course, we are discussing here clinical trials and the reality is uh, beyond these clinical trials and the more challenging lesions. And from that regard, I, I think it's uh, in interesting to look at the long-term experience also in the more com complex lesion subsets. And I think these, long, these, these complex lesion su subsets will remain also the challenge uh, for the next years to come because uh, we still don't know exactly which technology gives us the best uh, results and how they best play together. And for that, I think we have to do future research in, in, in that direction to figure out, you know, for which patients really a stand-based technology might be, might be better or, or how far can we go with the balloon and combination with tech and whatsoever. And then uh, I think uh, in a way the percutaneous bypass is if you want to, uh, the, probably it's certainly intriguing because of its uh, novelty of the approach and uh, uh, also an interesting option. Also, I would predict it's, 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 it's for a relatively small uh, group of patients. Um, yeah. But I think we are going to hear more about this particular subset of patients with complex lesions in the future. So with that, our short time here in Viva Inscripted comes to a close, and I want to thank you guys for, uh, for your thoughts and interest, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thank you.